The year was 1944. Across Europe, the Second World War raged on. Over the skies of Britain, Germany, and Italy, vast formations of aircraft thundered daily, dueling for supremacy. American P-51 Mustangs escorted bomber streams deep into enemy territory. British Spitfires defended their island. German Messerschmitts and Fuckerwolfs tried desperately to claw back control. But something new had entered the fray. Sleek, powerful, and utterly different. Jets, the German Messerschmitt Mi-262, the world's first operational jet fighter, shocked Allied pilots with its sheer speed. Suddenly, the propeller-driven fighters of the Allies looked outdated. Britain scrambled its own jet, the Gloucester Meteor, into the air. And the United States? The richest, most powerful industrial nation in the world? And so, in desperation, the U.S. Army Air Forces turned to a small, secretive group inside Lockheed, led by a man who would become a legend, Clarence Kelly Johnson. What followed was a tale of genius, urgency, and audacity that produced America's first jet fighter, the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star. In Germany, the Mi-262 was entering squadron service. Its speed, over 540 miles per hour, made it untouchable to most Allied fighters. Britain's Meteor, though less capable, was already intercepting V-1 flying bombs over southern England. And the US, still deeply committed to piston engines. While Rolls-Royce in Britain and Junkers in Germany invested in jet turbines, America's industry largely focused on churning out thousands of tried and tested aircraft. It wasn't incompetence, it was prioritization. At the time, America's factories were producing over 96,000 aircraft annually. The U.S. had the world's most formidable air armada. Why gamble resources on unproven jet technology? But by 1943, the risk was clear fall behind in jets, and America's dominance in the skies could collapse. The call went out, build us a jet, and build it fast. Clarence Kelly Johnson was not a conventional engineer. At Lockheed, he'd already designed the P-38 Lightning, a twin-boom fighter that defied convention and became a deadly long-range escort. But Johnson's genius wasn't just technical, it was organizational. He believed in small, agile teams, free from bureaucracy, working in secrecy. His design group became known as the Skunk Works, a name that would later echo through aviation history. In 1943, the Army Air Forces gave Lockheed an unprecedented challenge, design and build a jet-powered fighter in just 180 days. That's six months. For perspective, most modern aircraft programs take six years just to move from concept to prototype. Yet Johnson accepted. And so began one of the most audacious sprints in aviation history. The team worked in near secrecy, operating out of a makeshift workshop next to a foul-smelling plastics factory. Hence the nickname Skunk Works. Every decision had to prioritize speed. Instead of inventing an American jet engine from scratch, the U.S. imported the British de Havilland Goblin turbojet. It wasn't perfect, but it worked. Designing the aircraft around it, Johnson's team created the XP-80, nicknamed Lulu Bell. Key features, straight wings for simplicity, bubble canopy for visibility, tricycle landing gear, more stable than tail draggers, single-engine mounted mid-fuselage with an intake in the nose. On the 8th of January 1944, test pilot Milo Bircham strapped into Lulu Bell for its maiden flight. The aircraft lifted smoothly, climbing into the California sky. It reached speeds over 500 miles per hour, astonishing at the time. Johnson had done it. In just 143 days, Less than five months, 
the U.S. had a jet fighter. Following the success of Lulu Bell, Lockheed refined the design into the production P-80 Shooting Star. Notable improvements included more powerful engines, stronger airframe for combat loads, armament of 6.50 caliber machine guns in the nose, drop tanks for extended range. The Shooting Star looked futuristic compared to piston fighters. Sleek, with smooth lines, it had none of the propeller clutter. It looked like the future, but there was a catch, time. By mid-1945, the first P-80s were ready for operational use. They were deployed to Europe, but by then, Germany had already surrendered. A handful of P-80s reached Italy in June 1945, but saw no combat. In the Pacific, the war was ending even faster. The atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought Japan to its knees before the shooting star could even make its combat debut. The P-80 had missed the war it was designed for, yet its moment was still to come. In the late 1940s, the newly independent U.S. Air Force, created in 1947, needed jet fighters to define its modern identity. The P-80 became its frontline aircraft, Renamed the F-80 in 1948, it formed the backbone of America's jet fighter squadrons. For pilots transitioning from piston aircraft, the Shooting Star was a revelation. The smooth, uninterrupted thrust of the jet engine felt alien compared to the roar and vibration of a piston. Takeoff speeds were higher. Landings required longer runways. Energy management was critical. The Shooting Star wasn't just a weapon, it was a schoolhouse for America's first generation of jet aviators. The P-80's true combat test came in 1950, when North Korea invaded the South, triggering the Korean War. At the outset, F-85s, as they were now designated, provided close air support, bombing and strafing enemy columns. Then came the shock. The Soviet-built MiG-15, flown by North Korean and Chinese pilots. With its swept wings, higher speed, and superior climb rate, the MiG easily outclassed the straight-wing F-80. Dogfights quickly showed the limits of the shooting star. Though brave pilots scored some kills, it became clear the P-80 was out of its depth. Within a year, the F-86 Sabre replaced it in frontline air-to-air -air combat. The P-80 was reassigned to ground attack roles. Still, its presence was critical. It bought time until better jets arrived. It showed America the urgency of continuous innovation. The Shooting Star's greatest contribution may not have been combat, but education. Lockheed developed a two-seat trainer version, the T-33 Shooting Star. This aircraft became one of the most successful trainers in aviation history. Over 6,500 built, used by more than 30 countries, trained tens of thousands of pilots for the jet age. For decades, young aviators took their first jet flights in a T-33. Some later went on to fly supersonic fighters, space shuttles, even lunar missions. In that sense, the Shooting Star's legacy was written not in victories, but in generations of aviators who cut their teeth in its cockpit. Though overshadowed by later jets, the P-80 was the seed of something far greater. It proved that America could design, build, and operate jet aircraft. It validated Kelly Johnson's Skunk Works philosophy. It forced the Air Force to rethink training tactics, and technology. From the P-80 came the F-86 Sabre, which dominated Korea. From Skunk Works came icons like the U-2 spy plane, SR-71 Blackbird, and F-117 stealth fighter. Without the P-80, the trajectory of American air power might have been very different. Today, the P-80 is rarely mentioned in the same breath as the Mustang, Sabre, or Phantom. It wasn't decisive in battle. It wasn't the best at anything. 
but it was the first. Museums across the United States preserve shooting stars, silent reminders of a moment when America leapt from one age into another. Pilots who flew them remembered the thrill and the fear of stepping into something so new, and aviation historians remember it as the spark that lit America's jet age. Epilogue, a brief blaze, an endless legacy. The Lockheed P-80 shooting star was aptly named. Like a meteor streaking across the night, it burned brightly, briefly, and then gave way to something greater. It missed its war. It was outclassed in its next. Yet it mattered, perhaps more than any victory tally could show. It mattered because it proved the United States could master the jet. It mattered because it trained the pilots who would go on to win future wars. It mattered because it showed that innovation, speed, and boldness could change the course of history. So the next time you hear the roar of a jet overhead, be it a commercial liner, a stealth fighter, or even a rocket to space, remember the P-80 shooting star, America's first jet fighter, the machine that changed aviation forever.